Thank you and good morning. Please, a round of applause for that wonderful introduction. And, uh, you know, there are aspects of that introduction I would just, I would take you on the road and you could just do that everywhere with me, although you deserve no, you don't need to give my introduction. You yourself are a giant in the field, not just in height. Um, <laughs> but uh, one who um, has really helped pioneer a lot of the work in uh, student affairs, higher education, in areas of equity and diversity, a real treasure, another real treasure here at Oakland University, and I value our friendship as well. Um, so it's exciting to be here, and you said 33 years, so did you start when you were 31? I mean, what, I mean, one? I mean, I was sitting there thinking about the whole 33 years. I actually start some of my talks talking about people who have 30-some plus years, and as a person who doesn't like he's a day over 30, I don't know how you pulled that off. Um, I'm 13 years in, and I've met some folks. In other fact, the other week I was at um, University of Central Oklahoma giving a talk. Is this going to bother you for taking pictures if these mics are in your way? OK, great. I mean, I just want to make sure I look good. Hurry up and <laughs> it's most important, right? Um, so I was at the University of Central Oklahoma to give a talk at a black male summit. Actually, it's a male summit, not black male summit, all male summit. And uh, the uh, Uber driver picked me up from the hotel that morning to take me to campus. And so he's driving me into the University of uh, Central Oklahoma, and he's telling me all about the area, and he's talking to me about how the city has really developed and grown over time. And we're having a great conversation in the car. And as we pull into the campus, he says, now, have you ever been here to Central Oklahoma? I said, no, no, this is my first time. He said, oh, and he said, over there is my favorite building. And this is the Forensic Science Building. It's very famous. And as we approach the Student Union, which is where I have to give my talk, I said, oh, so this is the building? He said, yeah, so you'll go in this building. He said, hey, young man, can I give you a piece of advice? He's an older gentleman. I said, sure. He turns around and looks at me, square my face in the back seat. He says, study hard. <laughs> Keep up with your homework, and you will succeed here at the University of Central Oklahoma. I didn't have the heart to tell him what I was really there for. I just said, that's probably good advice no matter what. Um, so we appreciate those who offer such good advice. I do want to say special thanks to and add my voice to the chorus of others um, with Dr. Adali. So a round of applause for her and her wonderful work again here at OU and for all of the opportunities that um, you've granted in this opportunity to come and speak to this conference. And to you and your staff, uh, you've been great to work with. Thanks for all of the arrangements um, and for making sure that I got here. And to Ron, who might be somewhere in the room, um, thanks for picking me up and making sure I got here safe and all of that um, and letting me have my call with my staff member. Um, I see other folks who are listed that someone on my team must have interacted with. Again, to the graduate assistant, Jeremy, who was in the back. Where have you moved to, Jeremy? Somewhere. Um, thank you for your good work in supporting this conference. And then, you know, as if this was like a homecoming for me. Um, because I've been to Oakland University before, I've been to conferences sponsored by Oakland University before, and I just love it. So good to see my friends in the room. And for those of you who have heard me speak, the good news is I'm not going to say everything that you've heard before. Um, in fact, the PowerPoint is different. So um, you can take notes too. And um, for those who have never heard me speak, I have a very tall assignment that is to live up to that bio that was set before. And I have every intention of doing so when my grandmother, who was alive, you'll hear about her by the end, she would tell me sometimes, as was mentioned, so I was raised by my mom, my dad, my grandmother, maternal grandmother. And they would you know, do lots of things. I remember when I was four or five, this is for those of you who are working with a young person, whether you're, they're on campus or off campus, my mom, my dad, my grandmother had a conference about me. And my grandmother, who was a public school teacher, told my mom and dad, um, what we must do is expose Terrell to as many things as we possibly can. She had heard from teachers who said things like, I'm bored in class. And when I'm bored, I doodle, or my mind wanders. These are you know, sort of bad versions, bad, bad interpretations of the same exact behavior that my grandmother witnessed. So some teachers will look at me and say, oh my gosh, he gets bored easily and he starts goofing off or he starts doodling, his, his mind wanders, and it was. I transplanted myself, even in a boring classroom, to a place that was far better than that teacher's classroom. I mean, I, I, I was sitting in school, bored to death, done with my assignment, and before you know it, I'm on vacation in Hawaii, although I had never been to Hawaii. You know, I just sort of made it up. That's what lots of students do all across the country 
even sometimes at universities, not this one, because everyone at Oakland University teaches and engaging and vibrant and all of that kind of ways. I know that, but I'm talking about other universities where you know students sit in classrooms with faculty who don't exactly know how to keep it r really engaging and upbeat. So my grandmother, who had witnessed this, said to my mom and my dad, he's not bored because he's not academic. He's not bored because he's not smart. It's that the, what's happening in the classroom is not challenging him enough. So it's our job to challenge him to expose him to a lot of different experiences, and they did. I mean, I was in a mall one day, I touched a piano, and my mom said, don't you touch that piano. If you touch a piano and break it, they were have to buy it, and I don't have the money to buy it. She's just going off, I, it was one touch, you know? Um, and my grandmother, who was her mom, leans in to my mom and says, don't yell at him like that. Kids can't hear you when you yell. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know? As long as my grandma was there, I knew I was safe. Now, when I had to go home with my mom, I knew I had to pretend like I, I agreed with everything they said. So while I was there, I touched the piano. My mom said, don't do that. My grandmother said, don't yell at him. Kids don't understand adults when they yell. She turned around and says, hey, Terrell, do you want to play the piano? I said, yes, ma'am. My mom said, we don't have the money to put him in piano lessons. We don't have money to buy a piano. Just stop with all these high expectations for him. We won't be able to do it. My grandmother said, well, then we have to make the sacrifice. And I said, what's a sacrifice? My grandmother said, you want to play the piano? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, you need a piano. So she asked the person, how much was the piano? The woman told her the price. My mom said, we can't afford that. My grandmother said, then we have to make a sacrifice. Now turn your head, I got to go to the bank. And she reached inside her bank <laughs> and pulled out all the, I don't know how much money she kept in that bank, but that was a whole lot of money all my life in that bank. Maybe not in the banks outside, but in that bank, she pulled it out and made a sacrifice. As a result, I can play the piano. And I'm musical as a result of this wonderful woman who made these sacrifices for me. Well, the cool thing about it is um, sometimes we have to invest in young people. We are all here because we invest in them. And it's those investments that keep us here. 13 years in, not yet 33 years in, but thir at 13, it's the longest job I've ever had. Um, and I remember when I first got started at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, I would meet colleagues like my next door neighbor, faculty next door neighbor, my office was next to hers, Dr. Norma Mertz. Norma would tell me when I started at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville in 2005, she would say, Terrell, I've been you know, a professor for 32 years or something like that. I'm like, 32? Oh my gosh. Why would anybody do the same thing for more than 30 years? That's what, I said it in my head, not out loud. I'm from the South, so I know how to be polite. Um, so I'm sitting here thinking, why would you do it? And, the, the, and I have really important questions on my head, President. That is, I'm thinking, did she drive the same path from home to work and home to all 30 years? That would drive me pretty much insane. So one day I'm at her house and I ask her, I said, hey, Norma, question. 32 years, maybe 32 by, I meant 33 by that time. I said, did you drive the same path from home to work? All That would just be so boring. She said, no, in fact, I couldn't. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, because there's now a mall where there used to be a dirt road. In fact, you know these stores and restaurants, she named them, I was like, yeah. She said, there used to be a highway, not a highway, a byway, a little road that we could cut through so you didn't have to take the interstate. Now all of that's developed. And she reminded me of the most important thing about the nature of our work is that as society evolves, so too does our work. Not just our path from home, to work and back, but the students we get to work with change over the course of time. Although we are dealing with different um, amounts of resources, sometimes high resources, sometimes, I mean, there's always high resources here at Oakland University and Oakland County, but I'm thinking about other counties where, you know, they have low resources and struggling resources. And um, so despite changes in resources, right, our work is also enriched by that. Our campuses change, as was, uh, we were driving up, Ron reminded me that the First time I ever came to Oakland University is best I remember. And actually, believe it or not, there's a person in here who says she remembers this. Four or five years ago, um, I just came for a department that wanted me to speak or something. I remember just being in a small room with two of my doctoral students and giving a talk and then going back to Ohio State. And I've come back for the, the conference, for uh, the Student Success Conference, and even now. And despite all of coming back, the buildings, you have more buildings from different visits when I come, um, all of this enriches our work. So this is what happens. Right when you think you get it with your job, something changes. Right when you think, this is it, my last year of doing this conference, you know what I'm saying? And then someone says, thank you so much for doing this conference. Before you know, you're like, oh, hold on for another 20 years, you know? Um, right when you think they don't pay you enough, 
Right when you think your work doesn't matter, we all know it's that student who sends you that email that says if it hadn't been for you or that conversation or that class or that five minutes in your office, I wouldn't have had my degree. And you say, there it is. It's all I needed to just hang in there. We have a great profession. Can we pr a clap for our profession? The profession where not only do we have long and illustrious careers, but a profession where I know lots of folks who you know, complain about their job. They're not sure if they ever make an impact. I know lots of people who complain about whether or not um, they are actually making a difference in someone's life. But in higher education, it's not every day. It's not every moment all the time. But we get indications that the work we do matters. And if you haven't heard it today, I need to tell you, you matter. The work that you do matters. OU matters. Every single speaker today, their sessions matter. Having looked through the list of conversations, these are important conversations to have, especially right now in our nation's history. Our students need us to have this conference. Our students need us to go to these sessions because I've met students all across. In fact, this is so fascinating. Uh, it kind of helped me with my, the, the driver you had uh, set up at the airport for me, so thank you for that. So I landed um, yesterday, you know, and it was a day where I too, turns out no matter how many times you speak across the country and no matter how many books you write and no matter how many citations Google tells you you have, there are days you wonder, is this, am I doing it? Is it the right thing for me to do? Am I making an impact? Well, yesterday I was sort of in my head about that and as I landed in Detroit's airport, and I'm getting out of the Southwest airplane. I hardly ever travel Southwest just because I want to see. I want you to sign my name to a seat. Um, but it's okay. I'm, I'm learning to love and appreciate Southwest. And so I got off the plane. I'm sort of looking through my bag to figure out where am I supposed to go next. And while I'm looking through my folder, a young man walks up to me and says, Dr. Strayhorn, I look at him, um, tall African, I mean, tall compared to me, but six-year-olds are tall compared to me. So um, African-American male, he's standing there. He's like, Dr. Strayhorn? I said, yes. He said, oh my gosh. I heard you speak when you came to Western Michigan University. Close my eyes because I see best when I close my eyes. Western Michigan, Kalamazoo. I said, oh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm in Michigan. That's why you're here. I said, yeah. So um, great. Nice to meet you. He said, yeah. Listen, I heard you speak. And after hearing you speak, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I knew then I wanted to go into student affairs. And I did it. And I graduated in May. And I'm coming back from an interview at a school in a certain functional area that he wants to work. He said, I've told my mom and dad all about you. Do you mind if we just take a picture? And by this time, we're at the luggage area, and my driver has a sign with my name. And of course, he's looking at me like, Dr. Strayhorn, short doctor, you know. And he, he ends up asking me, well, we'll come to that. Um, so, he, so the sign that he's holding up says Dr. Strayhorn, but I don't think my driver knows that doctors come in the fun size. And so. Um, <laughs> The young man's like, can, can we take a picture because my mom and dad know all about you. And he missed class yesterday in order to go to his interview. And he said, I bet a picture with you would mean a lot to my professor. So I asked the driver, do you mind taking this picture? He took the picture. And as the young man sort of looked at the picture, he posted on IG. He's writing all these great things about um, our interaction. I'm walking with my driver. And it just at that moment, I needed, I got what I needed. And that is, even when you don't know it, words you say sometimes impact a person propel them to know exactly what they want to do. And as a result of a single conversation you have with a student on the phone, in your office, a parent, a guardian, an auntie, an uncle, a pastor, a mentor, next door neighbor, whoever you work with, as a result of that, someone decides to go to grad school and then two years later, you happen to bump into each other in the airport, you never know the kind of impact that you make. I think for me, this is um, the sort of backdrop to the important work we do in higher education. Now here's what we know about higher education. One is that higher education is an enormous enterprise. We have 21 million college students in the country educated across 4,300 colleges and universities. Oakland University is one of 4,300. In fact, um, half of our enterprise are two-year community colleges. So if you compare like apples, you know, apples to apples, then you're not actually um, comparing yourself to the 4,300, but more so to other like-sized and um, similar selectivity four-year institutions. Great enterprise, 21 million college students, 4,300 college and universities, over 1,000 online degree programs. And we've opened up access to higher education in enormous numbers, not just because of the good work of those in the room who are committed to issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion, although their work is enormously important to the successes that we've witnessed. But we have in this country, of the 21 million, 2 million of them are African American. 
We have almost 2 million Latino Americans, lots of Asian Americans, Native Americans, students living with disabilities, LGBTQ students, students who are low income. As one student reminds me in Memphis, Tennessee, hey, what about me? I'm no income. We have no income students in higher education as well, students who don't have a single piece of resources or any resources to uh, sort of pay their tuition to make it through higher education because we've opened up access really to higher education for large segments of our population. That does not mean that we don't need to do more um, in, turn, in the way of access, but I think we have opened up access quite a bit in this country. In fact, I would argue that we've opened up access so much and increased diversity so much in higher education that quite frankly, we don't know what to do with it. And it's not like we have enormous diversity everywhere, but even the diversity that we have witnessed, we don't know how to create inclusive environments where even those who are newcomers to our, our um, campuses and our institutions feel like they, are, they matter, they're valued, they are part of the campus. That's why these sessions that at come later, you must go to them, listen to the presenters and raise good important questions so that it can enrich our work. We have lots of diversity, relatively um, more diversity than ever before, but even the diversity that we have, when I start interviewing students, surveying students, I find that most students feel siloed, alienated, um, stuck in their exclusive racial groups, groups based on other identities, and I think we owe it to them to figure out now that we're harnessing diversity, bringing diversity to our campus, what can we do to foster meaningful connections, build community? That's the theme of the conference, building community. So we have um, so many students of color in higher education that I don't know we know what to do with it. And the other thing is we have so much increased diversity in higher education that we are no longer sure what is our distinct history. In other words, whose history do we celebrate in higher education? Do we celebrate the contributions of Native Americans in meaningful ways on campus? Or do we leave it to the Native Americans to do that? Do we celebrate the experiences, contributions, life experiences of LGBTQ members of our society? Or do we leave it to the LGBTQ community, community to figure out when we're gonna celebrate that, activate their own agency, have their own conferences, invite their own speakers, teach their own courses? Or do we um, celebrate the contributions, the achievements, the illustrious history and legacy of African Americans, or do we leave it to African Americans in the month of February to educate us on that? And February is an important month, but it cannot be the only month. Carter G. Woodson, who's the founder of Black History Month, predated or pre-called uh, Negro History Week. He's also a Virginian, like myself. I'm from Virginia. Carter G. Woodson was born in New Canton, Virginia. And he talks about the legacy, the history, the heritage of African Americans, and that this history is not just black history. Where's my good friend, Professor DeWitt? Uh, it's not just African American history, although his classes mean a lot. It's our history. So how do we, as we bring increased diversity to Oakland University and The Ohio State University and any, you fill in the blank, university or college in this country, how do we then recreate, reconstruct our collective history so that it really is a sum of all of our parts. Um, this is important because it's the core elements of sense of belonging. It's how we build community. We don't build community by not redesigning, not rethinking then what creates or what sets us apart as a community. Community, the word is defined as a collective of individuals who are held together by, listen to this, common language, traditions, values, customs, music, now, some, before, um, you know, at the founding of Oakland University, Oakland University is a relatively young um, institution. I'll say at the founding of the institutions where I have worked, um, I was not a part of that history. I was not a part of that community. In fact, I tell my students now, in fact, I, if I have, I have one more visit to Oakland University and I'm gonna just name myself a visiting professor here. That's what I'm gonna do. It's just gonna be on the internet. I'm a visiting professor. I'll get the president to authorize it and that's one of my titles gonna be. Um, but at Ohio State University, you know, um, I was not a part of, uh, my history was not a part of its founding. So when it started setting the parameters, the guidelines for what the community would be like at Ohio State University, they're not alone because the University of Tennessee Knoxville is the same, right? Um, when they were setting the standards, parameters for what would be community here, me and people like me were not a part of the campus. The traditions of that campus 
were set by people who do not look like me. The language, the customs, the values. So as many more people are brought to the campus, I think part of building community is re-evaluating all of those parameters. What's our language? How inclusive is it? What are our dominant values on campus? The ethos that if you are part of OU, you know here's what we believe in. How inclusive is it? And those things that are not inclusive, they're far more exclusive. We start to reconsider, reevaluate them. And when our language doesn't fit anymore, we start to reclassify, redevelop. We have a room full of talented people. We have lots of sessions. I see one of the presenters over there. I just recognize your picture in the book. Um, but uh, one of the presenters. And so at these sessions, that's where we do. We roll up our sleeves and do the hard work of trying to figure out, OK, so then how do we start to reconstitute some of these classifications? And how do we start to reset some of the language? My best example of this is shown on the screen. One third of college students in this country identify as first generation students. First generation is an important term. It's defined by the federal government as you are first in your immediate family to complete college, not just go. If mom or dad went and they never collected a degree, you are still considered first generation by the federal government. It's the person whose family has completed a degree who is no longer first generation. Well, about three years ago, I started studying foster youth who find their way into higher education. That's a phrase that I intentionally use because any foster youth who finds their way or is in higher education literally found a way or made one to get there because most institutions don't have sustainable bridges and pathways and programs, especially not pre-college outreach programs that really draw them to our campuses. I think there's another assignment for someone in the room who understands this problem, has a passion for it. How can we make sure that there are sustainable and clear pathways or bridges to OU for foster youth in this country. There are 400,000 foster youth in the United States. Every single year, 20,000 of them age out of the system. Upon aging out, they sit with their caseworker or their social worker who says to them, you know what the goal is. The goal is independent adult living. What do you need to get there now that you're aging out of the system? 87% of foster youth who age out of the system say, I need higher education a two-year degree or a four-year degree. I ain't making it out there without it. Well, as a result of 87% of them saying, I need higher education, still today, less than 9% of foster youth ever earn a college degree. So years ago, when I first started as a professor, it was 2005. You know, I like my later, my more recent work than my early work. If, it, if you see anything written by me in 2005, 2006, just hit delete. Don't read it, please. Um, you know, it was like back in the day when I thought I knew something and I was just writing because I had to write. My thoughts more recently, I think, are things worth holding on to. That's that early work that should be buried. Um, but, you know, 2005, I would use terms like first generation college student. And it, I used it because that's what they taught me in graduate school. And I remember someone saying, um, you know, you're first generation. And I, I said, really? And they said, yeah, because you're African American. Well, actually, that's a racial classification. That has nothing to do with first generation. And my mom went to Hampton University. It is true that a lot of students of color are first generation, but it's not um, synonymous. It's not all students of color are first generation. My mom went to Hampton University, a historically black college in Virginia, and she collected the degree. She earned the degree, which makes me, by the federal government's definition, not first generation. Well, in studying foster youth, it was a study that we were doing, um, an interview study. I remember asking a young man in the interview after he completed the questionnaire um, to let me know, and I would just take him off to a room and interview him. A few minutes after I gave him the questionnaire, he said, I'm confused. What's the answer to number six? I said, it's not a quiz. You had to figure it out for yourself. He said, well, the question is, am I first generation? I said, oh, first generation is defined, and I've given you the definition. First in your immediate family to complete college. He said, yeah, but which family? I love that, but don't do that. You'll take me to church, and he already told you I'm a preacher. Before you know it, I'll be like going, right? So um, I said to him, I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I have three foster families. I have one adopted set of parents, and while talking, you can see the light bulb go off in his head and say, oh, I have biological parents. I don't even know them. Which one determines if I'm first generation? And the answer is we do not know. As a, pro as a policy community, as a practice community, and as a research community, we don't know. To me, 
This is what happens when everything that happens in higher education, all of the community values, all of the language, all of the classifications, all the norms, when the community is set by the majority without any reference to the newcomers to the culture, any reference to the minority. That is, that's what happens when we set policy and classifications in higher education based on the majority and never look to the periphery and see, do these classifications even fit those students who we're going after? And the, oh, the cool thing about it is if we can open up our mind to the idea that first generation is not objective, it masquerades around like it's objective. Objective means we can either be it or not it. If we can accept the fact that that's not true for first generation um, foster youth, then it opens up the possibility that there might be other newcomers in higher education who struggle with not just that category, but other categories. These categories are important. Because to me, if you're going to build belonging, one strategy for building belonging is broadly conceived connecting students to resources, assessing their needs. We're going to talk about needs in about a slide or two. Needs, matching needs with the resources we provide. Figure out what they need and then connect them to what they need. That helps them feel like they belong at OU. That'll help them feel like they belong at any U. Well, so this is part of the problem. We use these categories. First generation, low income, student of color, LGBTQ, high achiever, low achiever, urban, rural. We use these classifications to make decisions about who's eligible for certain resources or forms of support. Scholarships, grants. In fact, some of these are the names of our offices. And there are students who literally are standing outside our door wondering if they can come in and get help because they don't fit the box. Were you looking at my notes earlier? Fit the box, check the box, right? So all of this I think is important, broad um, ideas for us to think about as we move into discussion of higher education. We've opened up access. We've opened up access a lot. I've underscored that point. I'm not gonna say that our work is done, but we have done a better job with access than success. I told my students through the entire month of February that we have to, every single class, five minutes we had, well, it wasn't five minutes, more like two minutes. We had a moment of silence and some discussion because I needed my students to understand that about 50 years ago, I could not have been their professor. In fact, I could not have been their classmate. And for a lot of my students, it just, it, 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 like, it hit them. They don't take enough African-American history class. They don't take history classes, period. Um, you know, but for them, they were like, really? I said, yeah. And if I wanted to come, and that's a question, if I could, I'd have to sit outside a window. Now, my class was on the third floor. Even up on, on the ground, I couldn't hear anything coming out of this classroom, right? I could sit outside and listen through a window. So before you know it, in a stat class, I'm teaching black history, and I'm teaching education, I'm teaching our history. We've opened up access, but we've not matched our work in access with success. I think that's really important because access without success is useless. What's the point of coming to Oakland University if you're not going to graduate? Now, it's great. You'll get good dessert, and you'll get good fruit, and with the president's help, you'll get good bacon and sausage and you'll get coffee and orange juice, and you have nice name tags, and those are really cool pens, that gold one that's in that, I, I've hidden mine because I don't want to lose it. Um, but you know, what's the point of coming to Oakland University just to leave with the pen? I was in Minnesota at a coffee shop, saw a student in the line who had on a university sweatshirt, I'll leave the university unnamed, but I was getting my coffee, about to give my talk at a nearby campus. I turned to the student, saw the sweatshirt, and I said, oh my gosh, do you go to that school? And they said, no, 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 I dropped out a years ago, but I got this cool sweatshirt. And I thought to myself, access without success is useless. You can buy the sweatshirt on the internet. You don't have to go to campus to do that. Why come to campus? Sit in the classroom. Join a club or an organization not to graduate. The goal is we must do all that we can to foster belonging, build community so that students have to succeed. In fact, um, Liz Witt, a good colleague of mine at the University of Iowa, has a phrase in one of her, her uh, publications that says, um, our job in higher education is to inhabit the gap between where students are and where we know they have to go. Our job is to inhabit that gap and to do like Vince Tinto said years ago, build such strong bonds of connection with them that they feel stuck to our campus. That even when they say, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm sick of failing my biology class. They say, oh, 
Well, if I leave, I know they're gonna come looking for me. I may as well stay and just graduate. <laughs> what kind of bonds you wanna build? In fact, I was on a campus, uh, Rose Holman University in uh, Terre Haute, Indiana, two days ago, sitting in a room full of students, and I asked them basically my sense of belonging survey question. I said, by a show of hands, how many of you in here feel like you belong? Hands went up, some hands didn't. By a show of hands, how many of you in here, if you had to leave this campus tomorrow, you absolutely know someone on this campus would come looking for you? Some hands went up. Said, who are these people? Before you know it, you started hearing about, well, my supervisor on my campus job, they're gonna be like, why don't you report to work? <laughs> Starts to be that bond that keeps them here, right? My roommates, because I have roommates and pretty soon they're gonna have to pay rent and they're gonna need my part of the rent. That's great, it's a bond that keeps the student bound. bound. For some of them, they said, it's the professor in the classroom. Heard a story from a, a student who said, um, when you're absent from this, and by the way, for those of you who are professors, I'm already giving you some strategies and ideas. Um, you know, for the student, he said, when you are absent from the classroom, the professor writes you. But they don't write you like an email that says, Terrell, you were missing. I am sure you know that I do not tolerate absences from my class, mister. You are cruising for bruising. None of that kind of stuff. No, it's not that. It's, it's a very short note, and it's really powerful if you think about it, and it's at the essence of um, so many core elements in my belonging research. The professor writes and says, Terrell, I miss you today. I really needed your help. Before you know it, I read and I say, oh, I'm important. I matter. He needed me. She needed me. Before you know it, I forget that I'm sick or playing sick, and I show up for the next class because my professor needs me. How many times do we as faculty and staff help students understand that we need them? The lecture really can't go the way I need it to go without your contribution. The video doesn't really have the impact that I hope it'll have until you're in the classroom to help us discuss it. Um, all of this is really important because it's the core elements of belonging, but it's also what students need. If you ask a student, I'm not going to say do it now because I'm talking and don't do it during the sessions later, but later in the day when you're not in the session, not listening to me or the other speaker, ask a student, why in the world did you come to OU? And interestingly enough, whether you ask at Oakland University or Central Michigan or Washtenaw Community College, it doesn't matter, ask a student in these campuses, what they're going to say is, I came to this campus to get a job. It's the number one answer that's been the answer for decades and decades. They come, they, no student, I mean, it's not that they don't want to be global citizens. It's just that when you ask them why'd you come, they don't say, you know, I woke up one Saturday morning and I decided I really need to go to college to be a global citizen. You know, I was really worried that I wasn't an active participant in democracy. I really worried that I wasn't doing enough in terms of economic development. That's not the answer that students give you. They'll get there if we give them the language, but primarily them, their families, their aunties, their uncles, their pastors, and interestingly enough, we'll come back to this, their churches, whatever their community groups are, want them to go to get a good job. I just said it, a good job. Most of them will say a job. If you ask them, will you say any old job will do? Because you could be an Uber driver. All you gotta do is have a car and a phone, right? They say, no, 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 I go to Oakland University. I should have a good job. Then you ask them, well, how will you know when you have a good job? And they'll say, that's easy. I should be making good money, right? And so then you ask them, well, what's good money? I was in Oregon at a, a campus about to give a talk in the coffee shop. I love coffee. You might pick up on this in my stories. Um, and so I'm waiting at the end for the barista to give me my coffee. They had just handed me my coffee. I turned around. There's a student. I love talking to random students. So I said to him, do you go to this um, university? He said, yes. And that makes sense because the coffee shop's on the campus, but that's fine. Um, so I said to him, do you go to this university? He said, yes. I said, so why did you come here? He said, to get a job. I said, any old job? I mean, you could be, you could like watch my coffee and I could give you like a dollar a day to do so. He said, no, 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 I should have good job. I said, how will you know when you have a good job? He said, because I'll be making good money. I said, what's good money to you? He said, I don't know, maybe like $100,000. I almost dropped my coffee and burnt myself to death. <laughs> I mean, literally, I thought, whoa. And he said, no, 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 okay, okay. Maybe that's a little high, a little high, wow. Um, he said, no, I mean, I could, t I mean, maybe 80. I was still shaking with my coffee, but it was in better hands. He said, you know what, no, maybe 60 you know what, I'll take 45. <laughs> I asked him, I said, what's your major? He said, mechanical engineering. If you've read anything recently, and I'm gonna have some screenshots made for this because I think it's something you need to see. In the um, New York Times education 
section, the Washington Post, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education, Money Magazine, um, all of them have done stories in the past two years about the public's shrinking confidence in the return on college investment. That some people don't know if they should come because they don't know what to expect when they're done. That's what it sounds like, folks, in a coffee shop. It's the mechanical engineer who comes to class, who does their homework, who goes to office hours, who holds on, and at the end, they're just not sure what they can reasonably expect as a trade-off for the investments they've made. I think those of us in higher education who are part of this culture, who are part of this community, need to do a better job helping students, families, everyone, the public, understand that there's still value to going to college and completing this degree. I've met young people all over the country, some black, some white, some tall, some short, some gay, some straight, some um, living with disabilities, some who are on iPads with headphones in their ear and still talking to me while texting on their phone. They all want to know, should I go to college? And if I go, will it pay off? One time I was being dramatic in a talk and someone asked this and I jumped over, I leaped over trees and plants to go to them. I got right up to them in their face and I said, let me tell you, if no one else has told you, college is worth it. So that's a book I will not write. I don't need to write that book because I firmly believe that college is worth it. It did it for, if no one else, me. My mom and dad can tell you, I remember when they came to my tenure party, they threw me a tenure party when I got tenure at Tennessee and they came to my party in the, in the I remember my dad giving comments at the party, and he said, my son's education has taken me and my wife places we never imagined going. Education, the investment in the young person, can help the mom, the dad, the auntie, and uncle see things, experience things, learn things that they themselves were not able to access. That's how wonderful higher education is. When you ask students, why in the world you come to higher education, they say to get a job. If you ask employers, hey, employers, what do you want? from Oakland University, they say, I want you to prepare students who will be ready for the workplace. Shown on the screen are nine skills and competencies that employers in Forbes magazine, Money magazine, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, lots of sources <coughs> suggest these are the skills they're looking for in today's graduates. So for my faculty colleagues in the room, what I would say is think about these in terms of you already have your learning objectives for your class. Ask yourself, or take a picture of the screen and then ask yourself, um, how might I make sure that students in my class pick up these other skills and competencies along the way? For those who develop campus-wide curriculum, how might we make sure that the curriculum at o OU also reinforces learning in these dimensions, these areas? For those in student affairs or the auxiliary programs, how might we, through the co-curricular, make sure that students develop skills and evidence that they have the skills in these domains and areas? And last but not least, the students who are in the room or future students in the room, which of these do you have? Which of these do you not have? And that sets for you your own development plan, the things you need to develop, the talents you need to strengthen and enhance over the next couple of years. Employers say this, we're looking for graduates of OU who can work well on diverse teams. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, go back to those sources like um, Time Magazine and other places. Look at the opinion, uh, employer opinion polls, and they would have said we want graduates who appreciate diversity. But after about 30 years, people in the workplace who only know how to appreciate diversity, whatever that means, they've clarified their point. No, not just appreciate, but work effectively with diverse teams. That is, work effectively with people who are different from yourselves, who know how to um, work with people who have language uh, challenges. And it's not that the person has a language challenge, it's that sometimes we have hearing challenges. We can't hear enough. We can't lean in for understanding and empathy. I was in an Uber one time, and my driver was in Michigan, actually, um, Detroit. And my driver, uh, my Uber driver, had a very heavy African accent. And he said to me, um, where are you going? He said, oh, I have a really heavy accent, so if you can't understand, you, can't underst you probably can't understand me. I interrupted him and I said, I can understand you fine. Can you understand me? And he said, yeah. And he paused for a moment. He said, you can really understand me? Everyone says I have a heavy accent. I said, all you got to do is just lean in for understanding. It takes a little bit longer. And the reality is this, folks. He was very difficult to understand. But there are two things that were happening in that moment. I was wondering, what, what, what would it be like if we just imagined a world where we were patient with one another? And students were patient with students. We just said, could you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry, is it Tyrell? Is it Turrell? Is it Terrence? What is your name? Juan? I mean, how do you say it one more time for me? 
I was on a campus one time. Have you ever heard that story? I was on a campus and the person introduced me as Juan. And I thought, oh my gosh. I thought you knew my name. I'm unfriending you on Facebook right now, you know? <laughs> but it also um, left me with like five minutes off my game because I thought to myself, do I look like a Juan? <laughs> Who is the Juan out there setting all the expectations of what Juans look like? Before you know it, I had missed my cue to go on the stage. I threw off my notes and my opening comments, and it, it was a good moment for me because guess what? That's what happens for students in classrooms where faculty don't remember their name. For, that's what happens to students who take the whole class and never hear or see a person who looks like themselves, ever hears about women in science, though they are a woman. It's that cognitive dissonance that disrupts our normal flow and pattern. Before you know it, not only that, but just like I missed my cue, students missed lecture notes, they missed part of the video, they missed the part that's gonna be on the test because they're caught up in their head with all these questions about belonging. Do I belong here? Where are my people? They don't even know my name. Where, or do women matter in this field? All those questions are critically important. They want graduates of our institution who can work well in diverse teams, critically important. They're also looking for graduates of our institution who can be proficient users of computer and technology, who can plan, organize, and prioritize work. This one's really exciting to me because um, one of my good friends in the room mentioned that he will be teaching at a, a teaching a class at uh, Wayne State. That's a campus I have a, I have a relationship. I'm gonna be a visiting a, a professor there too. I think I'm just gonna name myself one there. You know, Wayne State, I've gone four or five times to give talks. I love the campus, it's a vibrant campus, much like like this campus doing good work. And um, one time I was giving a talk about belonging and there was a professor in uh, science, a uh, biology professor, teaches large sections. She and I started a um, sort of email relationship where after my talk she said, hey, here's what I heard you say, here's what I took from what you said, and here are the kind of ideas that are popping off in my mind right now. She started helping me understand that um, this point about planning, organizing, and prioritizing work, you know, in higher education, student, it'd be hard for students in the curricular, not the co-curricular, but in the curricular to pick up skills in planning, prioritizing, and organizing their work. You know why? Because most faculty, if you're like me, give them the plan the first day of class that we've worked over all you know, summer long. It's called the syllabus. And the syllabus tells them, here's what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, in what order, here's your assignments, when they're due, Here's, a, I mean, if you do it the right way, especially the way that makes students uh, get it in on time, uh, you outline in bullet form, here are the elements of the assignment you gotta think about. Here's what I'm expecting, a one-page cover page and then a two-page this. And if you're like me, you go the next step and say, and by the way, because I don't trust you to get it done, the first paragraph is due next week. <laughs> you gotta send your topic to me for approval by the end of this week. Now I just wanna give you feedback on the first three pages. Before you know it, it gets the assignment done. It reveals that they have picked up some information from our class, but these broader skills, these transferable skills, I don't know that we have evidence that they have done. In fact, we might have actually um, pushed in the opposite direction, that they become dependent on a plan that's provided to them. Someone else prioritizes the work for them. Someone else tells them when to complete it and how. And this is what happens. If you read, want to read it, it's in the, this is the Forbes magazine piece. It's about employers talking about when they've hired recent college graduates who get on the job and they, you know, they're enthusiastic, they're excited, they're ready to be promoted day one. They think they should have the corner office with the window. You know, they're like, fine, cut my pay $5,000, but give me the whole summer off because we had the summer off in college. You know, all of these unreasonable expectations that, I don't know if they're unreasonable, they're different if, if nothing else. Um, but most importantly, the, the employer says, hey, here's what you got to get done. You're gonna get, we're going to work on this. And before you know it, they have a problem delegating because they've always crammed the night before. We've always given them the option to work alone or in groups. And when given the choice, they do it alone. Even when they're on a group, they do it alone. Um, and as a result, these students don't know how to plan and prioritize. Well, the professor, my email, me, email buddy at Wayne State, has helped me understand in her class, she has some um, unit, it's just, a, it's just a class, a class session, not the whole class, but a class where in the past she has done lecture, task, a little more lecture, task, a little more lecture, task, end of class for that day. She said, after hearing you talk about this and the fact that I really want my students to be ready for the workplace, I decided to change it. 
just that one class, not the whole class. You don't have to give up the whole syllabus, faculty, but the idea of changing a single class session. She says, now what I do is I front load the instruction. I tell them, here's the order of the day. I'm gonna show you these three things, and then your assignment will be in the class to complete these three tasks. But I'm gonna add a small piece to the assignment. She gave her lecture, slide, video, any questions, stop. Here are the three tasks. Now you can work independently or in groups to complete the three tasks and the time that remains. But before you end today, I want you to, on a sheet of paper, on email, whatever, write down to me, one, how did you do the three tasks? Which one did you tackle first and why? Did you do it by yourself or in groups and why? And before you know it, she started helping them reveal to themselves how they operate as a worker and a learner. She also picked up information from her students about this so that she can now cultivate people who know how to work. So those who said, I did it by myself because I don't like people. <laughs> she now knows what to do with them. Those who say, I did it in a group because it sound, I thought it was going to be easier in a group. Now she helps them understand group is not always easy. These are the skills that employers want us to cultivate in our students. They also want us to make sure that our students, graduates of OU, can still imagine, create, and see connections and be storytellers. The imagine, create, and see connections is really interesting because most um, theory suggests that if the end of a process is a connected product, if the end of a process is a connected outcome, the separate and discrete pieces, parts, must be combined somewhere along the way. If the goal is to produce a connected learner, higher education as a process must start connecting something before they graduate. Something must start coming together before they graduate. And I don't think we do this very well in higher education because higher education is actually organized into two divisions called Student Affairs Division and Academic Affairs Division. By the way, if you look up the definition of the word division, it is a ant antonym that is the opposite of connected. So our process is the opposite of our goal, divisions. The, the divisions are further divided into departments. Anybody in here teach English, major in English, take a class in English ever in your life, right? If you look up the definition of the word department, it is a synonym for the word division. So the divisions are further divided into more divisions, and the divisions are further divided into majors and minors so much so that I think the student ultimately has such a specialized and highly technical educational experience, but at the end, we expect them to be connected learners in the workplace, and that's virtually impossible to do. Listen to this. This is what my best example of how we have to really shore up our efforts in this area are. I was flying to South Texas to give a talk at a community college. I was on a small plane. I'm talking about a really small plane. Have you ever been on the small plane that only has like six rows and it actually has propellers on the wings? I don't know why we make these things, but they still, they still operate, it turns out. Um, so I was on one of those small planes flying to South Texas. As was mentioned in the um, introduction, I'm not just, I'm a small guy, I'm a petite guy. You gave a lot of synonyms for the word small. Um, you know, at some point I was like, ouch, stop, you know, I'm not that small. But here's the cool thing. Listen, I was on a campus just a few days ago. I got to tell you, for all the fun-sized people in the room, you got to back me up here. I was on a campus the other day giving a talk, um, and I was speaking to students, and I told them, I said, you know, one of the students said, oh my gosh, I have a question for you. Are you an adult? And I said, um... <laughs> I, yes, and I think you have to be to be a professor, but that's okay. Don't worry about that. Um, but I told him, I said, here's the funny thing about that. I, you know, I joke about my size. I love jokes about my size because I'm very comfortable with my size. But sometimes when I start speaking, I forget how small I am. Sometimes when I write, I feel like I'm 6'3". There have been moments when I've stepped into my why and started activating what I think I was purposed to do, and I feel like I'm your height. And that's true for all of us in this room, and it's true for our students. That's what education can do. The, in fact, the Greek the, and the Latin derivatives of the word education is to draw out that which is within. One definition even goes as far as to say the purpose of education, the definition of the word education is to draw out the light that is within. It was my sixth grade teacher who started that process for me. I was cutting up in class, being the class clown, because I learned from my peers that to make it through public education, I would either have to downplay the fact that I liked school to earn the respect of my peers. And the way that I downplayed the fact that I liked school was I goofed off in class. That made me respectable to my peers, the bane of my teacher's existence. 
but I was also like a closeted academic. I was a closeted smart guy, a closeted um, honor student. That is, I didn't tell any of my peers that I love math and that I'm working hard. I would just pretend. I'd look at the A on my science test and throw it in the trash can and say, oh my gosh, I bombed that science test. Did you fail too? High five for all the failers, right? But then teachers started posting grades on the wall and they'd see it. Before you know, they're like, Terrell, you ace. I'm like, that's got to be a typo. I'm definitely like the, you know, whatever. So I learned all these things. But I was in sixth grade. Miss Carolyn Cannon, who was my sixth grade teacher, my first and only African-American teacher. I don't know if that's causation or correlation, but Miss Cannon, one day after I tried this death-defying feat and threw myself from my seat in the middle of the spelling class, everyone laughed. Miss Cannon said, get up off the floor and get in your seat. And I want to talk to you at the end of the day. I thought she would forget, so I tried to rush off to the buses. She grabbed me by my arm. They could do that back then. Grabbed me by my arm. <laughs> and uh, actually, with my mom's authorization, you could probably still do it today. And so Miss Carolyn Cannon grabbed my arm. She said, Terrell, I told you I want to speak to you. I said, what's up? And she said, um, you need to stop cutting up in class. First of all, you're not that funny. <laughs> First time a person gave me honest feedback, <laughs> teacher gave me honest feedback about my cutting. She said, and secondly, you're way too smart to keep cutting up. And it meant something for a teacher to tell me I was smart. She said, here's the thing, Terrell, I don't know, I've taught lots of students, but when I look at you, if you ever believed in yourself, like I believed in you, listen to this, folks, my sixth grade teacher, who's now deceased, she died a few years ago of cancer, my sixth grade teacher said, when I look at you, Terrell, I see enormous potential. If you could ever believe in yourself like I believe in you, I think I just see you traveling the country and speaking to lots of audiences to draw out the light that is within. And if there's nothing I do now, I travel the country and speak to lots of audiences. And it's my sixth grade teacher who looked at the class clown and said, that's not your role. This is your role. And when you step in your role, before you know it, said it at the Achieving the Dream conference on the West Coast a few weeks ago, it ends up pushing, propelling students to endless possibilities. That's what we want to do is not only produce the learners that um, employers want, but also to equip students for their futures. And students, when they talk about their futures, we have 40 million Americans right now working in jobs that didn't exist three years ago. Shown on the screen are just a few of those jobs that students of all of our institutions might go to take on. But interestingly enough, we know that they'll never get there if they're not successful with their degree. And one factor that really matters for student success that I've written a lot about is the basis of the 2012 book. It's the one that I can sign if you get it here today or however we're going to do the books. Um, Sense of belonging really matters. I shared with Ron on the drive in. I'm working on the second edition of this book. I'm really excited about the second edition. You know why I'm really excited about the second edition of the belonging book? It's because of each and every one of you, your students in every institution in this country who has contributed to my work over the last 12 years. It's students, it's faculty, it's staff like those in this room who write and say, here's what I'm doing in my classroom. I had a teacher and um, a professor at a campus one time say, after hearing you talk, I walked into my classroom that very next day and I wrote on the board, you belong here. And as students walked in and they kept looking at the board like, what in the world is going on in here? This is not what we, this was not our assignment. But she said she sat there and waited for them all to arrive. She said magical things happened. Students came in, some of them started taking pictures of the board. She said, um, I need to start the day off by just telling you all you belong here. Immediately, some students started tearing up. She said, if no one's told you, we care about you. The returning adult mom who has two dependents, works two jobs, tries to fit in enough time for a class at Oakland University, broke down into tears. And the professor said, what's wrong? Talk to me about what's going on. Before you know it, she started telling her story. Another student breaks out into tears. And you say, what's wrong? Tell me about your story. She said, well, I didn't know she was going through all that. And she was in my group last week. And I was so hard on her about not being able to meet the meeting time. Before you know it, community was built. What was the provocateur? What was the provocation? It was simply writing, you belong here on the board and talking to students about their belonging experiences. That's what the second edition of the book will uncover. In the book, I talk about belonging being a feeling. I highlight in yellow the words I want to emphasize here um, before we close. One, sense of belonging refers to a feeling that members matter to each other and to the group. Also, it's a shared faith that members' needs will be met through their commitment to be together. I told you earlier, building belonging, a strategy for building belonging is doing, um, using proactive techniques to assess students' needs. How are we using data at Oakland University 
to assess the needs of students? What's our working um, knowledge of student success rates at Oakland University? I think that campus administrators, regardless of the end of your title, whether you are vice provost or you work in IR or you work in HR, any of the R's, right? Um, diversity and inclusion. It's not just the Office of Diversity and Inclusion that should know the success rates of students of color. It should be working knowledge of the president, the provost, everyone in the cabinet, um, legal affairs. Yeah, clap. That's okay. You can clap on that. Everybody should know. I love that, a clap. I'm telling you, you're gonna take me to church by the end of this. I can see this, what kind of crowd I got today. Um, it must have been the bacon. Okay, so all of this has to happen. Working knowledge about success rates. Because here's the point, our goal is for all students to succeed. At any given moment, we gotta know where we are tracking our progress toward that goal. Who's almost there? And how can we sustain the efforts that are in place that um, equip their success? Who's nowhere close to where we want them to be? And how can we reinvest, create new strategies and new opportunities, new initiatives to support their success? Working and whoever is the data folks on campus, if that's not true for Oakland University, here's the takeaway from the day. How can you start to um, use creative data visualization techniques so that even the person who did not major in stats can quickly get that information and know it. How can you, you don't need me to be here, how can you, although I love being here and I'm a visiting professor so don't get rid of my title yet, um, right? But how can you make sure that at other gatherings, you don't even have to have a conference, but you might have um, what I call chat and choose, where faculty and staff come together on a day, a light lunch, to hear from IR or the data people about student success rates. Listen to this, disaggregated by identity. You don't have to invite the public to that meeting. That one's for in-house, but we talk candidly about the success rates of black students, Latino students, LGBT students. And by the way, you can't have the LGBT rates or even students living with disability rates unless you ask the question. So we might have to redesign some surveys and data sets and databases so we get the information. And I'm gonna just say this now because at the end of this, when we have Q&A, someone's gonna say, hey, what about this? <clears throat> Happens everywhere. I'm talking a lot about students because that's my assignment. But I think we also need to keep up with what's happening with faculty and staff. Turnover, attrition, newcomers. How can we use this information? Because ultimately, this is the community we're trying to build. Um, sense of belonging is a feeling. And in my book, I ground my work on sense of belonging and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. By a show of hands, how many of you in here have ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? This is fantastic. That means I don't have to go that far into this. Maslow says this, as humans, we all have basic human needs. Air, water, food, shelter, sleep, and sex. Maslow said it, not me. <laughs> but you better get some because um, if you don't, you can't get higher order needs. In fact, you can't, until these are in place, you can't go to higher order needs like our safety and security needs. Safety and security in the book, the present book, I talk a lot about physical safety and security. But over time, students have really enriched my understanding that safety and security have other dimensions. It was a student in uh, Washington State who said, Dr. Strayhorn, physical uh, safety and security is not just physical safety and security, it's also my emotional safety and security. It was a student in Arizona who said, Dr. Strayhorn, it's not just about physical safety and security, but what about food security? She tells the story, taking a math test, failing the test, the professor gives it back, pats her on the shoulder and says, you gotta study more. She said, no I don't. They said, really? Why so? She said, I need to eat more. She tells the story, she studied the night before, she just didn't eat. And because she didn't eat, she couldn't really rest easy. And she woke up that morning hungry, and during the test, her mind was distracted by her stomach. And anybody who's taken a psychology course or teaches a psychology course knows that in contemporary psychology, there is this concept called working memory that is a very useful metaphor for how we behave as humans. That is, that it is really hard to devote any part of your working memory to a math test because some of it is tied up, taken with your stomach, thinking about when will I eat, where will food come from, if they have any dependence at all, how will I feed them, and all of that is drawing on that working memory, and it's only the balance of that that we have available to devote to the test often leads to success. How do we in higher education, how do we at Oakland University help students meet their basic needs, these basic needs like air, water, food, physical safety, and it's only after those are in place that higher order needs like love and belongingness emerge. It's also a feeling, a student said this, it's like a sixth sense, a warm, tingly feeling that you're in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. 
I love that because sense of belonging is a feeling. It's this notion that students either belong or do not belong. I've always wondered, not always wondered, but I've wondered the past couple of years, where did we get this preoccupation with making decisions about who fits in and who doesn't? Who belongs and who doesn't? How many of you remember playing these when you were growing up? It's interesting. I really start to identify these sort of everyday activities as early efforts to socialize us to make decisions about who fits and who doesn't. It also subtly socializes us, programs us to make decisions about what constitutes a group. Remember, what we're talking about today is about community. Community is a group. And whether or not we own it, we have been conditioned, programmed, sometimes in obvious and less obvious ways, that groups are comprised of people who are similar. It's only those things that are similar that belong. How do we, first of all, deprogram ourselves, reconstitute our understanding of group, that groups are actually at best, or at their best, when they are diverse? It's, the, it's when the chicken and the horse and the watermelon do make sense. And if they don't make sense at first, how do we use our positions, our programs, and our policies to draw connections between the horse, the watermelon, and the orange? How do we use our programs, our policies, and our initiatives, even our classroom, to draw connections between rural, urban, and suburban neighborhoods? How do we use our programs, our policies, and our initiatives to draw connections between the first generation student, the adult learner who's returning, as well as the veteran who's now in the classroom? I remember working with a program in Columbus, Ohio as a pre-college outreach program. And we collected uh, evaluation data on the program. And I was in uh, Walmart, if you ever heard me tell this story before, with my god sister, who um, was a part of that program, my god sister, whose son uh, goes off to college. He goes to the University of Dayton. And by go, I mean he got admitted to the University of Dayton. Remember, after we all celebrated his success, my god sister would tell me something. She'd be like, you know, Terrell, I didn't think he would get out of kindergarten, let alone go to college one day. I'm so proud of my son. She was in Walmart, and uh, we were in Walmart. And she was in the school supply aisle. She had not told me why we were there, but I was just with her, hanging out. And she turns to me and she says, hey, which of these two pins do you like? And if she had given me that gold pin that's in there, I would have said, that's the one, right? But she gives me two pins. She said, which of these two pins do you like? I point to one of them. She throws it in the basket. She grabs some notebooks. She says, hey, which of these two notebooks do you like? Do you know what trapper keepers are? Don't know why we still make those things, but yeah, she showed me one of those. I'm like, get that out of here. That's like a dinosaur. I showed her a one subject notebook. She threw that in the basket. She pulled out these calendars. She said, which of these calendars? I said, stop. What in the world are you doing? We're not going through this whole school supply. I don't have all year to be here. And before you know it, she said, that's right. I'm sorry. I'm wasting your time. She threw the calendars in the basket. She said, we can just leave. But before she turned, she did this. As she threw the calendars in the basket, she grabbed the side of the basket. She said, the universal sound of despair. Some of us have heard it on the phone when we're working with students. Some of us have heard it in the office when we're working with students. Some of us have, um, who work in parents' programs or parent outreach have heard it with parents, guardians, mentors. It's the universal sound of despair. I think those of us who work in higher education have a um, responsibility, I would say even a professional responsibility, to respond to that sound. Some people won't go that far. We at least have an opportunity to respond to that sound. And though she's my god sister, I hear that universal sound of despair. I feel compelled to respond to it. So I go over to her, I say, hey, are you OK? And as I put my arm around her, I can feel her body moving. I know now she's crying. I lean in for the hug. I said, it's going to be OK. Why are you crying? And she gets up, and you can see her mascara is running. She said, because I, you know, Terrell, I'm so proud of my son. I said, I know that. But how does that relate to what we're doing in Walmart right now? She said, because he's going to college. And remember when he? went to college, he said, uh, you told me, you said, same thing that your mom and your dad said about you, that me and my husband have to expose him. And so I said, to start with the exposure, I would just come to Walmart and give him a few items so that he's set up to be successful in college. He said, and I got right here to Walmart in the school supply aisle, and I realized I don't know anything about college. I said, what do you mean you don't know anything about college? He said, I've never been. I've never even been on a college campus. I said, oh, that's right. 
My god nephew is first generation. She said, first generation? What does that mean? I said, first generation, first in the family, the complete college. She said, he's the first in the family. He's the first in the neighborhood. He's the first in our, he's the first in our entire church. And she reaches in her pocket and pulls out a wad of money. She said, they took up an offering for him in church on Sunday. And other families gave because they're proud of my son. In fact, our head deacon said, go to college and make us proud. And I came to Walmart because I wanted to let him know that everybody's rooting for you. And we're in our your corner. And I got here to Walmart and I realized I don't know anything about college. I'm about to send my son to a place I've never been, to work with people I've never met. I said, Bonnie, what can I do? She said, tell me it's going to be okay. I said, it's going to be okay. Before I could catch myself, I was crying myself in Walmart. She said, I'm so sorry I made you cry. I said, no, you didn't make me cry. I need to cry. The reason why I need to cry is because I've written books and journal articles and given talks and conference presentations and TED Talks and webinars about first generation, I came all the way here to Walmart with my own god sister to realize I don't even get it. That I have no idea what it's like to send a kid to a place you've never been and entrust your very best and brightest, your precious dear ones, to people you've never met and to entrust to take, to take them to a place that they've never been. And so many families wanna know that at the end of the day it's gonna be okay. Listen, August 11th, 2016, I was on a campus, SUNY Binghamton, about to give a talk. My cell phone buzzed. I looked at my cell phone, and this email was shown on the screen. It was from a student who said, hey, Dr. Strayhorn, um, would it be possible for me to move in a day early because my mom got the dates confused? Have you ever watched Charlie, Charlie Brown where like the teacher at the front is like want, 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 right? So for me, this email, this part, this first part right here, got the dates confused, move in early, something about a mom. The rest of it, I never even read. I'm like, wait, 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 what are you talking about? Move in, move in where I'm not looking for a roommate? And your mom, what does your mom got to do with me? You know, all this stuff is going through my head. So before you know it, have you ever been so busy and you knew you had a short period of time to respond before reading the whole message you just write back? And here it is, I write back and say, help me understand what you're referring to, move in where? And I'm thinking to myself, August 11th, 2016, who's moving in somewhere and why in the world are they writing to me? I'm not a landlord, I have no property, and you can't come in my house. Um, <laughs> August 11th, 2016, who's moving in? And it hit me, oh, students are moving in. Maybe this is a student at my, my institution. Why would a student at my institution write me? I don't work in housing or res life. The only student who would write me at my institution about moving in earlier would be a student who is completely lost. Who in the world be lost on the day of move? Oh my gosh. First year students, aw. <laughs> first year students. How many of you in here remember the first year of college and how confusing and crazy it is and how many questions you have? I see this hand go up all across the country. Before you know it, I'm like, wait a minute, that's so rude. I wrote back and said, help me. Let me write back and begin. He had not responded. I wrote back and said, hey, first of all, I think you might be a student at my institution. You might be a first year student. If so, congratulations and welcome. Next paragraph. By the way, if you're asking about moving into a residence hall, you shouldn't be talking to me. You should be talking to someone in residence life or housing. I don't work in either of those areas. Have you reached out to those offices? Write me back. I'll wait to hear from you. He writes back and says, yes, here are the three people who I contacted who work in housing and res life. A quick Google search revealed that none of them work in housing or residence life. <laughs> in fact, one of them has never worked at Ohio State at all. Now, the person has been incarcerated in the state of Ohio, but you probably shouldn't talk to them about moving into a residence hall. So I wrote back and said, don't write to him. No, I'm joking. But I wrote back and said, hey, they don't work in housing or res life, but I'm copying on this note the people who can help you. And I'm asking my friends to reach out to you because I'm about to give a talk. I'll check on you later. After my talk, I looked at my phone, saw a thread of emails, jumped to the last one that said something like, Dr. Strayhorn, you rock. My mom loves you. I'm like, I am single. Um, so. <laughs> You know, um, and he says, by the way, we're so excited. I can move in early. This is great. Go Bucks. I write back and uncopy all my friends and ask him, hey, by the way, where'd you get my name and number? Am I like on the wall of some bathroom that says, hey, dazed and confused, contact Strayhorn? Because if so, I got to get that removed. He says, no, no, no. I remember why I reached out to you. Because when me and my family came to campus, remember, sense of belonging is about a shared faith. Faith is about belief. The question is, when did students start believing in us? When did students start believing in Oakland University? And why do they believe in Oakland University? He said, I remember you because when we came to visit the campus, you were the keynote speaker. 
And at the end of your talk, you said, if there's ever anything I can do. <laughs> Students are listening. Their parents are listening. They want to know that our words matter, that when we say things like you can call on me, that I actually can call on you, and that I can do something. Listen, on the screen are lots of strategies. They actually map onto many of the sessions that are to come. I encourage you to go to those breakout sessions, draw on some of the points from the keynote with the presenter's information, and figure out how we can build community here at Oakland University. The last point of this slide is the most important. That is, no matter we're working at the individual or the institutional level, remember that everybody wants to belong and people matter. And for me, this goes to a lesson that I learned from the best professor I ever met, a master teacher, my maternal grandmother, Creola Evelyn Warner, my mom's mom. She helped raise me. She was a teacher. She was a mother. She was a singer. Born October 6, 1925. October 6, this year will be a hard year, uh, day for me. It's always a hard day because she's gone, but this year I'll be a keynote speaker at a conference in Florida. And I usually declare my grandmother's birthday a national holiday and I don't do anything. But this year I decided why not do what she taught me to do and what she did her entire life, and that is share the message. When my grandmother was alive, she would say to me, Terrell, what's these things you travel the country giving, baby? What are those things called? I said, they're called a keynote. She said, uh-huh, I'm gonna get me one of them one day. <laughs> She never lived to give a keynote, but she's lived to be the keynote. When my grandmother was alive, whenever things went wrong in my world, I went to my grandma's house. When I had a bad day, I went to my grandma's house. When I broke up with somebody, I went to my grandma's house. When they broke up with me, I went to my grandma's house. When days were good and we had bacon and sausage and all that, I went to my grandma's house. When we didn't have it, I went to my grandma. I loved going to my grandmother's house. When my grandmother was alive, she said, Rel, baby, you're so good with those computers. When I die, I want you to make my program. I want you to make my obituary. My grandmother, when she was alive, you'd go into Hardee's and they would meet her and they'd say, oh, Miss Warner, you were my second grade teacher. You'd go into, uh, I had, my grandmother put us in swimming lessons. My swimming instructor, I remember when they first met my grandmother, they said, Miss Warner? She said, yeah, baby, you know me? They said, Miss Warner, you were my fifth grade teacher. You go to Piggly Wiggly. You know what that is? It's a grocery store. The manager of Piggly Wiggly would say, Miss Warner, you were my third, I thought North Carolina didn't have but one teacher. It was my grandmother. <laughs> In my grandma's honor, when she died, I did use a computer to create her obituary. I drove into town, New Bern, North Carolina, took it to Kinko's. It was in a folder much like this. I handed it to the agent. I said, my grandma's died, and I need these programs copied, about 300 copies. They opened it up and immediately broke into tears, and they said, Miss Warner's dead? I said, did you know her? They said she was my fourth grade teacher. It'll keep you here, this profession, to draw out the light that is within. I always went to my grandma's house, but after my grandma died in 2013, I didn't go to her house. I haven't been to my grandmother's house in three years, but in December, I told my mom, I'm going to my grandma's house because when she was alive, I always went. Now that she's gone, I've never been. December 11th, 2016, I went to my grandma's house. I drove up to my grandma's house. I remember she has a yellow house. It's a beautiful home. I loved her house. She has a big yard. I remember chasing my sister all across that yard growing up. She has a big tree in the front yard. I fell out of that tree when I was like eight or nine. She has chickens behind her house. I used to chase her chickens. And she would sit in her kitchen and through the window scream, don't run my chickens. I loved the sound of my grandmother screaming, saying don't run her chickens as I chased them. This Year, last year, December 11th, 2016, as I pulled up to the yellow home and got out of the car and put my foot on the grass, I looked down at the grass and I realized I never came to Highway 58 South for the grass. I looked up at the tree that's still standing and I realized it was never the tree that drew me to that house. I looked behind the house and there were the chickens and I realized as much as I loved to chase them, it was the sound of that precious woman inside the house that made that place home. Students don't come to Oakland University for the buildings. They don't come to Oakland University and they say, have you ever seen the hallways? The hallways are so big. <laughs> Students come to Oakland University because of the people in this room. It's the faculty who teach the classes. It's the staff and the administrators who organize the work. They come for their, it's the people that matter. Thank you.
That was a tremendous and very important message. I'm trying to stop crying. Uh, we have time just for two to three questions, and uh, Professor Strayhorn has consented to respond as best as he can to those questions, and I'm sure they'll be very interesting and dynamic. So if there are persons who want to ask questions, I will entertain those at the present time. Come to the mic so that everybody can hear the question clearly, and then uh, we'll get the response. So if you have questions, please come to the mic in the center of the room. Well. <laughs> yeah, well, somebody's got to break the ice. Um, so uh, if, I, if I think back at the history of academe, we've been dealing with first generation students now for a very long time, at least since the GI Bill, right? And the, and the makeup and the background uh, of those first generation students has changed over time as things have gone through the civil rights movement, women, people of color, LGBT students. And, but our graduation and retention rates, I remember when the, um, the NCAA started looking at these among athletes and if they had seen 57% nationally, they would have shut down most division one football programs. So what, are, what have we become or maybe what have we failed to become as institutions in this country, as academic institutions, where we're not, after all this time and all this experience, where we're not having success with first generation students in, at, at this point in time? Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a great question. And it's, um, for first generation historically, I mean, I re, there are lots of reports that talk about first generation students and African American students, especially African American males. And, the um, sort of conclusion of those reports are, we're basically the same way, we're, we're exactly where we were 30 years ago. Now, um, you know, that's not because we have not invested dollars in trying to solve the problem. We certainly have had lots of conferences and lots of gatherings and lots of initiatives and, you know, but pouring money into, I mean, and money matters, so let's not pretend like it doesn't, and thanks to all the sponsors for supporting all the good work here, we need many more resources to do so. But I think, um, and I, I try to avoid this word because I remember hearing it in graduate school and it sounded like this big thing called paradigm shift. You know, people say a paradigm shift, it sounds like the world will start moving and you'll feel it. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually am thinking that it's the paradigm shift that has not yet occurred. We, we will create a new program and we'll, adds a, a piece to a person's title, or will give a person who's already hard pressed for time yet new responsibilities. But we have not started to really engage in a paradigm shift that starts to say, what if we don't even understand the needs of first generation students? Like drawing on the experience in the Walmart, how does that help us? How have we started to really reach out and inspire and educate mom, dad, auntie, uncle, guardian? Make them part of our solution. Um, how do we start to figure out, okay, so when you come to first, by the way, the theory behind first generation is this. The reason why we're so preoccupied with that term is we've made an assumption that if you are first in your family to um, go to college or complete college, there are things that you won't know about college that a person whose mom or dad went to college will know. Now, if you hold that up for inspection, that's a faulty assumption. I went, my mom went to college. And I asked my mom, I said, hey, did we have conversations about college when I was growing up? She said, yeah, conversations like this. I told you, you better go. <laughs> I said, yeah, but did you ever sit down and talk to me about like office hours and, and, and academic advisors and how to pick a major and a minor? She said, no, what in the world is that? Because she forgot by the time she finished that she was supposed to talk about these things. My mom went to a historically black college. I went to a predominantly white institution. My mom says, a very, um, a very innocent question to me one day when I'm at home. She says, um, I went to an HBCU. You went to a PWI. Aren't they different? Shouldn't the conversations be different? What is it I should have talked to you about? So in 2014, I wrote a piece about parental conversations with college students. And what is it that parents should be transferring? Well, um, they don't have to read my piece. Maybe that's part of the solution. Maybe through our pre-college program, our outreach to parents, part of orientation is not just working with students, but specifically working with the families of first generation college students to start to fill those gaps with that information. Do they know the language? 
Um, only in, in higher education as a culture, we've got our own language. Only in higher education do you know what a provost is. <laughs> only in higher education you know what a bursar is, right? Only in higher education do you know that the word registrar is a title. It's not register misspelled. <laughs> only in higher education do you say things like prerequisite. I remember a student said, what's that word that you pre, 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 what's that word? I said prerequisite. They said, isn't that basically what y'all make me do before I can do what I want to do? <laughs> so yeah, that's a good way of describing it actually. They said, why don't you just call it that? Credit hour. A mom in that pre-college uh, program I told you about said credit hour. She sat down the first week. They said number of credit hours, credit hours. She said, and why wouldn't she? She said, I remember thinking about this credit hour. And I thought to myself, if my son or daughter go into college, Depends on my credit. They don't stand a fighting chance. I said, what do you mean? She said, my credit is shot. I have really bad credit. I said, oh, no. That's not what we mean by credit hour. But I realized what she was doing. She did what we all do. That is, when you meet something, meet a word or a phrase that you don't know, you start thinking about, when was the last time I heard it and what did it mean then? Credit hour has nothing to do with your FICO score or your credit worthiness. It's simply a term that we've borrowed and created that simply um, refers to the weight that we assign to educational experiences. Maybe that's part of orientation. Breaking down those language barriers. Helping first generation students and their families learn that. Maybe it's a specialized session. Maybe it's part of everyone's orientation. I think that's the, how we get there. And when we get to that kind of paradigm shift where we rethink the whole enterprise, the needs, and then map them, match them to resources, I think we'll see the kind of gains we, we're looking for. Thanks for that question. Others? Yes, one more question. Uh, good morning. My name morning. is Donna Aaron. Um, I do not work in higher education. I work in corporate America. In fact, I learned about this conference through my uh, six-year-olds elementary uh, school. Um, I work in diversity, multicultural um, through my profession. Um, but my question is, is how do I be a support for children and advocate for their belonging of this community um, outside of higher education? I think that uh, you don't need to be a professor or in faculty in order to bring that sense of support. And so I think we're all in sense of um, support, supporters in our respective communities and how can we translate that to other <coughs> children and make sure that we're, we're still mentoring and, and, and having those extensions outside of just higher education or waiting until they get to, to college. It's a great question. And it's a great uh, point for us all to end on. So, how I organize my thoughts here. First, I mean, you can. That's the, let me affirm that you can be an advocate for youth and students outside of higher education. And students need advocates everywhere, especially because if you remember the slide earlier, I talked about the fact that students come to higher education so they can get where you are. They come to higher education so they can get a job. And when they move out into the uh, workforce, they need to be prepared for that. And part of it is they need to feel a sense of belonging. I met so many students who, um, actually, when I was at Rose Holman, students who were going to go work for Smuckers students who are going to go work for Texas Instruments, students who are going to go work in these industries and businesses, and there are a lot of them, women and people of color, who are looking for, like when I get there, will I belong? Will I fit in? Um, so I think, one, this whole notion of student-centered, it's like one of the core elements of belonging. If we're going to foster communities or build communities where students feel a sense of belonging, we have to be student-centered. I don't mean student-centered like what's already in your mission statement or already in some strategic plan. I mean truly student-centered. Again, the paradigm shift where we go and we start thinking about what does it mean to be student-centered? You know, my mom would tell us when we were growing up, I have a beautiful mother, beautiful dad, um, and they have a lovely home. And my mom would say to me all the time, no, um, this is still y'all's home. Just because, you know, you've moved out, this is still, your, anybody who's ever, you know, had kids get up and get out. Um, you still want them to feel like this is their home. And so I remember one day when I went to back to my parents' home as an adult, I was sitting in the living room. My mom said, no, this is your home too. You know, this is going to always be your home. When I'm gone, dead and gone, I want this to be your home. So I put my foot up on the chair like I would at my home. My mom said, get your foot off that chair. I walked into the living room and she said, you know, we don't, we don't hang out in here. We hang out in the den. And I said, this is supposed to be my home too, right? So this um, child-centered home is not really child-centered. Higher education is like that. We say it's student-centered, but where can students go? 
Where can they metaphorically put their feet on the chair? Where are they welcomed in their fullness? Oh, you asked the hard question, so I got to go there because this is my last question. I got to tackle some points that the presenters I'm leaving up to y'all to talk about. But I mean, I've met too many students in higher education who say things like, I've met folks who don't let me be myself. Um, I have to make decisions about how I look, the clothes I wear, how I wear my hair. Asian students who have to change their name because we're not patient enough to figure out how to pronounce their real name. It's hard to find a sense of belonging in a space where you cannot go by your real name. It's hard to feel like you belong in a place where people tell you you don't fit in, your clothes don't look like you're academic, your hair doesn't make you, and if anybody's got hair problems, it's me. I got lots of hair tucked under this hat. And I tell students all the time, I used to be bald headed, like I cut my hair bald. Um, and then I let my hair grow out, and now I let my hair do whatever I want to do. It depends on the day, and you know why I do it? Because students need me to. Because someone who has the mic and someone who has the stage and someone who has the corporate job has to be that advocate for them that says, we are more than our hair. We are more than our clothes. And that's the kind of advocacy you can do. The last thing you can do, I think, for students is prepare them for where they're going. And there are things that you know about corporates, about businesses, that I think working with folks in this room as a partner, um, that it enriches what happens here on the campus, but also maybe in some of the work that you do through civic organizations and so forth, you can help students make sure that they develop the skills that they need to be successful. I tell students all the time, especially students of color and women and low-income students and no-income students and first-generation students who um, have come up in communities where they are taught to be humble and to be modest, that modesty and humility go a long way. But in corporate America, when you go to get that job, you got to be com comfortable feeling confident about yourself. Not conceited, but confidence. What we call um, self-efficacy. There are three levers for self-efficacy. Verbal persuasion, vicarious experiences, and mastery experiences. And there it is. I'll give you my best example of these three played uh, in application. You said I apply things really well, right? So my grandmother, when I was six years old, and you'll love this president because my grandmother was making breakfast, and my grandmother, whenever she made breakfast, made bacon and sausage and pancakes and eggs. And my grandmother's at her uh, kitchen, and she's making pancakes and sausage and egg. The phone rings. She's on the phone with one of her choir members who tells her they're not going to be at church on Sunday, and this is a person who's about to lead a song. She gets off the phone. She says, now, what am I going to do now for a lead to this song? And she looks over at me at the table, and she says, I have a great idea. I said, <laughs> she said, no, baby, I need you to sing this song on Sunday. I said, ma, I don't sing. She said, you know what? You will sing because you're my grandson. I'm the grandmother. You're a kid. I'm an adult. And you're in my house about to eat my food. And anybody, OK, 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 I'm going to sing on Sunday. What song do you want me to sing on Sunday? She said, I want you to sing this little light of mine to draw out the light that is within education. She said, this little light of mine, I said, well, the good news is I don't even know that song. She said, I'm going to teach you the song. And my grandmother said, uh, taught me self-efficacy before I ever met it in graduate school. She said, here's the words to the song. She sang it while flipping pancakes and scrambling eggs, never missing a beat. She said, now it's your turn. You sing. The fact that she gave me the words and said, I can do it, that's verbal persuasion. When she sang herself and taught it to me, that was vicarious experiences, role modeling. And then when she turned and said, now it's your turn to sing, that's mastery experience is the third lever. I said, Ma, I don't want to sing. I want to eat breakfast. She said, now sing. And before you know it, I'm like, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Whoa. You know, all this stuff. <laughs> like any little stubborn kid. And she said, you sound terrible. Feedback. My professor, my sixth grade teacher gave it to me. My grandmother gave it to me. Feedback to students helps their belonging, helps them know what they got to do to belong, where they are. My grandmother said, you better practice because on Sunday, I'm going to call you up to sing that song. Instead of practicing, I prayed and said, God, please let her church burn down or something before Sunday, you know, <laughs> so we don't have church. I don't want to sing the song. Sure enough, God wasn't listening to me because I woke up Sunday, felt great, went to church. This church was still standing. Uh, my grandmother called the choir up. She called me up, and I'm like, no, I don't want to do this song. The piano player started playing the song. I turned to my grandma and said, Mom, please don't make me sing this song. And she said, sing. And I got up there, and I did like most eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds who lack confidence and aren't prepared. I broke down crying. And the cool thing about being seven or eight and crying in front of everybody is everybody still stands and says, oh, poor little baby. So I thought, they're standing. My job is done. I was ready to go. <laughs> my grandma said, no, get back here. You still got to sing. And I said, Ma, I can't do it. She said, if you tell yourself you can't do it, then you can't. But when you tell yourself you can, you can. Someone tell a student that. She says, and now close your eyes and sing for Mama. Had she said, sing for Snoopy or sing for Donald Trump, I mean, sing for anybody else, I probably wouldn't have done it. But she said, sing for Mama, a woman who 
I love. Before you know, I remember closing my eyes in front of all 58 of her members, grabbing my blazer, and it's probably this blazer that I had when I was eight years old, <laughs> and saying, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.